Okay. And I'm not giving it up. All right, so let's let's get started. So now everyone is fed and happy. And so now I, I'm gonna actually tell you what a sheaf is mathematically as well as intuitively. And hopefully that will make the whole point of this being a tutorial on sheaves actually seriously what it is. Uh, so let's remind you where we are in the discussion. So we talked last lecture about topology. So that's this blue region. Now we're gonna move up into the yellow region uh, and talk about sheaves and what are called cellular sheaves. Um, and that will take us through this lecture and the next. Where in particular, this lecture will be mostly uh, building up the theory, giving you some examples. And the next, we'll talk about some very concrete examples that we've played with before, uh, that you've played with before in data science as well. Uh, okay, so I want to really say what some of the objectives are of this. You know, what, what is data fusion? And what is heter heterogeneous data fusion? Fusing many different kinds of data. Uh, and merely answering that question in a serious fashion, sitting down and thinking about what really I want data fusion to be, will actually answer the next question, what is a sheaf? And once we've done that, we can ask, well, all right, what if I have something that looks like a heterogeneous data fusion problem, but I don't have a sheaf? What's, what happens? And then look at some examples. Okay, so let's start off. The first thing that I'm going to do, and I'm going to do this axiomatically, I'm going to tell you axiomatically what are the different things that you would like to have and walk through what the data what the data fusion problem is from the point of view of these axioms. So in particular, what are the desiderata? What are the things I would like to have happen? So first of all, if I'm going to talk about a data fusion problem, I need to have some data. I need to have a set of data sources, which could be a list of tables, a list of sensors, a bunch of objects that I know some things about. That's totally fine. Um, and so for, let, let's make this very concrete. I have a bunch of tables. These tables are records telling you about students. So some records about high school, some records about undergraduate institutions, graduate institutions, and postdoc institutions. Now, these are various tables. They tell you something um, about the students that are there, OK? Now, the second axiom is that, well, these, not just that these tables exist, but these tables contain information useful data, and that those attributes are something that I can list, that I can talk about. So for instance, the records that I have in high school might have a high school ID number and a high school GPA. Undergraduate institution has a, an ID number, which is probably different, um, as well as uh, the undergraduate GPA, but most undergraduate institutions want to know your high school GPA, they put in the records, okay? Now at grad school, they're interested in your graduate ID number, your undergraduate GPA, they'd like to know that, they know the grad GPA, and maybe you get a stipend. Okay, now as a postdoc, you've got an employee ID, and they want to know your GPAs. They don't necessarily care about your high school GPA, but and they also know your salary. Now, these various tables have some subtables in common. So if I build up a topology on these data sources, this is the third axiom, is that there's a topology that allows me to talk about shared attributes. So in particular, the high school and the undergraduate, they share an attribute, a column out of these tables. They share the high school GPA. They don't share the ID numbers, per se. Maybe they share names or something like that. Now, the high school does not share the high school GPA with any of these other institutions. But these other institutions do share, the, say, the undergraduate GPA and possibly the graduate GPA. OK, so this topology is the sort of thing we talked about in the previous lecture. So you've built up this topology of these shared attributes, and the topology corresponds to various kinds of subtables. So subtables are smaller tables consisting of the columns that are in common. So just as I said, the high school GPA is present here. The undergraduate GPA is present there, here. Here we've got the undergraduate and the graduate GPA. And if I think about these three tables in common, they have the undergraduate GPA in common. Now, Tables don't necessarily have to be just, I completely pull this column and drop it here and pull that column and drop it there. I'm allowed to have some kind of transformation between the data. So in particular, perhaps the high school reads out on a 100-point scale, as mine did, and the undergraduate only deals with four-point scales. So you'll have to do some kind of transformation. So for instance, here's possibly some data for one student. 
They got a 91 as their high school GPA. That corresponds to a 3.7 on the four-point scale. And that's what the undergraduate institution stores. So these two scores, even though they're numerically different, they're, they're consistent from the point of view of what they mean. Now, similarly, the various other entries in these various tables are also consistent. So the graduate, or rather undergraduate GPA is 3.5, and you can see it's reflected in all of these various tables and subtables. Graduate GPA is also reflected. And notice the salary and siphon information is applied. OK, so the point of the matter is that I can compare the data from these various tables to know if it's consistent. So in particular, <clears throat> if I take a look at these various pieces of information that I can assemble for a given student, I can assemble a summary if I have access to all these tables. Now, I probably don't, in general, have access to all these tables, but in principle, I can put them together. So for this particular student, I can read off from this structure saying, ah, here is their high school GPA, here's their undergraduate GPA, their graduate GPA, and their salary. So this is giving me some portion of the network of tables. Now, one thing that comes out of this is that, well, I'm doing, in essence, some table joints. I might end up with empty tables, as in there may be some inconsistency. If I grab the wrong student, for instance, out of one of the tables. So for instance, if that student that we grabbed said instead of a 91, they've got a 70 there, I can tell you we're not dealing with the same student. Or maybe someone's falsifying records. We don't know. One of those possibilities is happening. But I can no longer make this kind of inference that this 70 matches up with a 3.7. That just doesn't, doesn't work out. So I might end up with saying that if I try to do a table join across this region that I've outlined here, I fail. I cannot join that table because I've got some inconsistency. So part of what I'm trying to do when I'm trying to do heterogeneous fusion is I'm trying to ask for mutual local consistency between various data sources. OK. Now, Mathematically, what I'm really after is not so much the specific numbers, but the tables and how they're transformed to one another, the spaces of data and how they're transformed. That's what's going to end up being a sheet. So what I've done thus far is I've specified axiomatically, in some sense, sort of informally, what I would like to have happen. I'd like to have data sources. Those data sources have attributes. Those attributes or these data sources are related based on shared attributes, I can transform them together and I can start doing joins when I have consistency. I may not always have this situation happening. Uh, in particular, one thing that certainly could happen, you know, if I have this situation here, I've joined this table and I've said, I think this is the same student because, well, the GPA is matched up. But do I know it's the same student? Well, not really because I don't necessarily match up the IDs. I'm not really 100% sure. So one of the things that you might like to have happen is that, in fact, if I attempt to make a join like this, that I really do actually pull out one student and that one student. Because then I can start making inferences to say, OK, well, here's that one student. This is what I know about that student. Let me see if I can extrapolate. As th this, this student here, it's all consistent over here. Maybe I want to then draw the conclusion that this person has got a particular ID. If I've joined up this information, notice the IDs were never shared. But now if I thought all those piece of, pieces of information were consistent, I'd like to infer that this is the same person, that this is one ID. I may not be able to. If I can, that's sort of the best possible situation. That best possible situation is what gives rise to a sheaf. OK. So this viewpoint has been table-centric, which is essentially bottom up. What I'm essentially saying is I've got tables on vertices of, a sim of this simplicial complex, sort of a bottom-up approach where I've got all the data there sitting in front of me, if you will, sensor-centric view. And the information when I take from a big table to a subtable, I'm restricting my attention from the big table to the small table. So I'm restricting my attention to say, I'm only going to look at this subtable for the moment and compare that subtable with the one I got from another. I, I could have done this in a completely dual fashion. I could be, instead of table-centric, I could be key-centric, in which case the keys are vertices. The keys are vertices. Now what I'm saying is I'm saying the various kinds of information that I've got kicking around, those are the things that I care about. So the questions that I'm trying to answer are the things that I'm worried about, not the data sources. The data sources then end up sort of intermediate between these keys, sort of a top-down approach. Instead of restricting information, I'm trying to extend information as much as I can. So this leads to a picture that looks like this for the same, same example. 
So I've got the high school GPA as a question that I could ask. I've got the undergraduate GPA as a question that I could ask, the salary, the graduate GPA, and the stipend. Now, what's sort of interesting about this then is these top dimensional faces, these top dimensional simplices, are actually now referring to institutions and tables. So the undergraduate institution now manages this table. The postdoc institution has these pieces of information. The graduate institution has these pieces of information. And so if you sit down and try to write these things out, you don't necessarily end up with uh, tables fitting together now. You're kind of feeling like you're ending up with keys being the thing that's most important. But this is a dual approach. And what I think is important to realize is, which way does the data flow here? Before, the data started on the vertices. The tables were on the vertices. And it flowed out towards the edges. Here, the tables are still there. And I'm still kind of restricting the information. But now the tables start out on these higher dimensional simplices and flow down to the vertices. So to get from the undergraduate institution to the high school GPA, what did I do? I had to pull out that one column. How did I get from the undergraduate institution to its GPA? Again, pull out one column. How did I get from the postdoc to the salary field? Again, pull out a column. So instead of going from bottom up, from low dimension to higher dimension, now I'm going from higher dimension to lower dimension. But it's essentially manifestly the same information, different view on the same thing. So this is a duality between sheaves and co-sheaves that sometimes plays out. And in some sense, from a, from a design standpoint, if you've got a top-down model, probably better to start with this construction. If you have a bottom-up model, it's usually better to start the other one. OK, so what happens when, when these axioms fail? Well, all right, so if you don't have your data in a set, I'm not sure I can help you. As in, mathematically, if, if your data don't actually lie in a set, I don't know, mathematics probably can't help you either. <laughs> so all right, fine. We're, we're, Hold that thought. Doing category theory anyway. Yes. We are doing category theory anyway, so hold that thought. Um, but now, if, 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 if I'm not topologizing my sources, so I'm not saying which data sources can be related, so I'm not putting in this topological space like I did in the previous lecture. Well, now, now we're, we don't really have a basis for combining data sources. I don't know that I've got an overlap. I don't know that these two sensors or these two tables are talking about the same phenomenon. So I really can't even have a basis for talking about fusion at all. Can't really say I'm putting the data. So that really is kind of a non-starter as well. Now, it gets a little more subtle, though, when we start talking about other things. If I can't, if I know two pieces of data, or two da table, ah, tables, data sources, are related, but I don't know the transformation from one to the other, now I'm sort of in a funnier situation. You see, although I might be able to make some kind of inference to say, all right, I've got this table over here that tell, talks me, tells me about students, and this table over here that also tells about students at a, another institution. And I know they're related somehow. I know that there are some people that are in common. But I have no way to transform the data from one to the other. I'm not really sure what I can do. As in, I look at, say, for instance, I might say GPA here, and I might say GPA here, but I don't know what GPAs I'm trying to match up. So from a, from a data fusion standpoint, you really have some more exploratory analysis to figure out what's going on. And without further information that will be gathered by poking around at it, you're going to be out of luck. Now, though, if we start talking about this situation where we fuse potentially not uniquely, now we're in a really interesting situation where I can say, OK, I have information. It's in tables. The tables are related to one another. And I know how to translate information from the bigger tables to the subtables. Know how to do all of that. But I may not be able to uniquely fuse the data, which is to say that if I see a bunch of attributes and a bunch of attributes from these two tables, and I bring them together, and they match up, and I cannot necessarily draw the conclusion that I'm looking at the same piece of information or the same phenomenon, well, I might be able to limit things. I might be able to, to say, well, I can limit the possibilities. But it may be impossible to infer anything else about nearby observations. This actually often happens in databases. In fact, I'll give you a very concrete example. So my name is Michael Robinson. It is a reasonably common name. Um, and this, this has implications, especially for travel. Um, because at one point, apparently there was a Michael Robinson, or someone with presumably a very similar name, uh, who was on some travel list. Now, it was not me, I can tell you that. Um, 
but uh, that was not so easy to convince the person behind the, the, the uh, ticket counter at the airline that indeed I was okay to fly. And so it would, was one of these kind of ambiguous situations where the, there were enough overlapping keys that said, yeah, you better check this a little more carefully. Also resulted in my password, passport having been taken from me for long periods of time. I, I mean, key is from, of the columns, yes. That, that, that's precisely what I mean. I mean column IDs. So which, which column ID am I examining? So that, that, that's what I'm referring, yeah, you, you, I'm not thinking of a hash key, for instance. I'm thinking of a column ID key. Yeah, but your uh, keys are uniquely defining the, the particular columns. And so I'm imagining I have a hash of columns, for instance. But the point is that, that if you're in a situation where you cannot do that kind of inference, then you're, you will have inferential problems. They will be unavoidable, is the conclusion. If, in fact, you're in a situation where they match up, and the only time you get perfect matchup between these two keys, or between, between overlapping sets of, of, of data, then, then you're great. Then you can do a very strong kind of inference, and that is, in fact, what defines a sheaf. So now, abstractly, let me actually tell you what a sheaf is as a mathematician and try to bring that to your level as well. So first of all, it's nice to think of this sort of as a Mad Lib. There are lots of sheaves in the world. Yeah? Uh, it's the same as question for the previous speaker. Uh, Yours? OK, I, let's hear it. Besides, I think everybody, most of the people in the room, uh, understand what you mean uh, when you say that this is an abstract. Yes. That's still a set. Okay, well, what is an abstract? What, what is it actually doing? Okay, no, so, so the, uh, in essence, what, what the comment was is that perhaps my data don't lie in, in, in something that I can enumerate all the different possibilities of what it could be. And so I, I may be in a situation where I'm saying that my data is in some particular unspecified thus far situation. So as in, uh, one, of the, one of the situations where this does definitely happen is, is I mean, it's not exactly true, but it's kind of in this flavor, is free text. If someone gives me free text, I really have no idea what to expect. It could be about anything. It could be referring to just about anything. And that probably is going to be a bit hard to reason with. And that, that's, in essence, what we're after there. So it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So abstractly, what, there are lots of sheaves in the world. What kind of sheaves are we talking about? We're talking about a sheaf of a particular data type on a particular kind of topological space. Um, and the prepositions are important to avoid getting confused. Uh, so there are lots of sheaves of, say, vector spaces. Those are sheaves that are giving you data that are numerical. Sheaves of groups. Those are data types where I'm getting out things that have an operation on them. Uh, but I could also have sheaves on a simplicial complex. I could have sheaves on a topological space. I could have sheaves on some other kind of delta complex or other such sort of construction, or a, say a hypergraph or something like that. So it's important to keep track of both of these particular answers, both of those particular entries. What's my data type? What's my base space? Once you know what those are, then we can actually write down a definition. So let's talk about sheaves on a simplicial complex. <coughs> That's probably the best place to start. So if I'm talking about a sheaf on a vector space, well, let's see here. I've got my vectors, uh, on my simplicial complex, rather. So, well, let's see. I've got different elements here. I've got vertices, edges, and faces. How do they fit together? Well, vertices are subsets of edges. Edges are subsets of faces, et cetera, because these are sets. OK, so what, what I can do is I can draw some arrows. The arrows are subset relations. Which is to say, this is a subset of this, this is a subset of this, this guy here is a subset of that one. You can think of them purely as subset relations. Or you can think of them as actual functions, if you like. This 
arrow is the function that maps v1 to v1 and v3 to v3. This is the function that maps v3 to v3, leaving v1 out of, out of its image. Those are totally fine. So this construction here, you can do whenever you have an abstract simplicial complex, or even in a hypergraph, you can write that sort of attachment diagram down. It tells you how the various simplices or hyperedges fit together. Now, what a sheaf is going to be is I'm going to ascribe some data spaces to each and every simplex. I've done that kind of randomly here. So what I've done is I've said, here's a three-dimensional vector space, R3. Here's a three-dimensional vector space, R3. Here's an one-dimensional vector space, R. And I've just assigned it all over the place. OK. When I take that data space and attach it to a simplex, I'm going to call that a, the stock over that simplex. OK. So this is going to be, when I'm done, this is going to be a sheaf of vector spaces on an abstract simplicial complex. These are all vector spaces. Now, I've got those arrows there still. I haven't forgotten about them. I should put something there. What I should put there is something that is most natural, as in most natural for the thing that I'm putting here. Most natural for vector spaces is linear maps, matrices. So here are some matrices. So what I've done is I've put some matrices appropriate to turning these arrows into actual functions. So this is a function from R3 to R2. So that's got to be a 2 by 3 matrix. Here's a function from R2 to R1. That's got to be a 1 by 2 matrix, et cetera. Now, I can't lay down any matrix I like everywhere, anywhere. I have to have some kind of constraints. And those constraints are actually fairly straightforward. And it's sort of a an old saw that whenever you see an algebraic topologist and they draw some diagram like this, it probably is one of those kind of diagrams that, that is called a commutative diagram, which means that I follow around any pathway of arrows and I have a bunch of different options. It shouldn't matter which option I choose. So in particular, if I go starting here at this vertex, the stalk over this vertex, and ending at the stalk over this two simplex, well, how many pathways do I have to get there? Well, I can go up and then down, or down and then up. And these are composing the arrows. Now, how do I compose linear maps? Matrix multiplication. So if I multiply this matrix, then this matrix, that's right here, it better be the same thing as if I multiply this matrix by that matrix. That's over here. You can check a little bit of row into column matrix multiplication that they match up exactly. And so, if you check everywhere you go in this diagram, that say, if I go from here to here along these two paths, that I get the same thing and follow all around every which way this thing commutes. So given that, con that construction, that's called a sheaf. And that, that is what a sheaf is, is it's this kind of diagram. So what I've done is I've built up every simplex. I've given it a data space. And every time I have an attachment, one simplex being subface of another simplex, that I end up with a linear map such that the diagram commutes. That's what a sheaf is. Nothing more and nothing less. Now, I could do stuff with it, very much like I did with the, uh, the student databases. I can assign data. I can take an assignment, which is choosing an element out of each and every data space, or some portion thereof. And it's, a, it's called a section. If every time I do this, and I follow the maps, every time I do this, I get exactly what's already there. So if I start out with this particular entry, it was in R3, and I map it forward here, do a little matrix multiplication, row into column with this matrix, I get that vector. And if I come from the other side, row into column with that matrix, I get the same thing that's already there. If every way I can follow this, every which way I follow it, I end up with the data that's already there. We call this a global section. Of course, sections don't have to be global. They could be local, as in I didn't define them everywhere. Or perhaps I've got some inconsistencies. So if I take this top guy, the 2, and multiply it by that matrix, what do I get here? Well, it's something with a 2 in it. If I multiply this matrix by, by or this vector by this matrix, I don't get anything with 2s in it. So it cannot be the same thing. It's inconsistent. So I cannot extend this section from this portion to these simplices. So this section is a section which is local and is not global. So this construction allows me to start talking about consistency in a way that is kind of useful. 
And any time I take a look at global sections, those are, in fact, the information that's gotten fused. And when I start asking about what is the space of global sections, if my sheaf started out with a sheaf, is a sheaf of vector spaces, space of global sections is, guess what, a vector space. As in, I can add these sections, and it won't change whether or not they match up. Cool. OK. That's pretty handy. Now, lots of sheaves out there have lots of global sections. And in particular, some of the, some of the less interesting sections, some of the less interesting sheaves out there are some of the things that people like to work with uh, from a data science standpoint. And these go under the name of flabby sheaves. These are the ones for which that consistency condition is not very useful. So for instance, if I have this particular sheaf diagram written over that abstract simplicial complex, this is a sheaf, over, sheaf of vector spaces over an abstract simplicial complex, notice whatever I put here, if I, if I take an element of R3 and map it through this map, what do I get? Zero. I don't have any other option. And if I take something over here and map it this way, what do I get? Zero. I get, it doesn't matter. It's always zero. So everything is always a global section if I pick an entry out of here and out of here. It's kind of in a, uninteresting. This is a flabby sheaf. Uh, sometimes if we're being fancy, we'll call it a flask sheaf. Um, same idea. Now, what's interesting is if you think about this is, this is essentially a vertex-weighted graph, where what I've done is on every edge, I've put the stalk 0. And on every vertex, I've put whatever I want my weighting space to be. It has no constraints. It has no further constraints at all. It's not very useful. Uh, on the other hand, you could, well, make a, an edge-weighted graph in pretty much the same way. How would you do it? Well, let me draw it. So same space. Here's the space. There it is. OK. And let's see here. I want to edge weight, right? So I want to edge weight. So let me say it's just one, one real number that I'm putting on that edge. Now, I don't want the vertices to matter. Well, this is a, not a sheaf. This is a co-sheaf, so let me turn it into a sheaf. What function is this? This is the zero map. This is a matrix. This is a matrix that looks like, well, just multiply by zero. Take in zero, multiply by zero, I get, guess what, zero. And it always matches with zero over here. Also, not very interesting. If I mess around with these sort of things, I find that there's not many constraints. So, when you get a flabby sheaf, it means that, they, that they're not very handy from the point of view of topological invariance. Turns out, from a mathematical sense, they they're very useful in that you can decompose complicated, interesting sheaves into a bunch of flabby ones. OK, that's good as a mathematician, but not so necessarily handy otherwise. So what, what I think is important from a modeling perspective, if you end up with a flabby sheaf after you're done modeling, what this means is that you need to do some additional modeling. Perhaps there's a statistical model that you need, perhaps not. OK. So let me give you a very concrete example. So if you've got a sheaf, or want to build a sheaf that models a Q, a first in, first out Q, here, here is one. This is a first in, first out Q of length 3. Each data space is three-dimensional storing the contents of the queue at every time step. Say this is one time step, this is one time step later, and this is one time step earlier. And what's retained between the time steps is the information that was in the queue that is still there. So if this is a three long queue, when I go from one time step to the next, what's preserved? Well, two data items are preserved right there. And what do these restriction maps do? They project out the information. So this projects out, say, going backwards in time, the second two entries, and going, going forwards in time, the first two entries. So that's pretty handy. And this example comes up a bunch of times, and it's quite useful. Here's an example of a section. I've got a bunch of data in here, 119. If I project it backwards in time, I get just 19. If I project forward in time, I get the leading portion, 11. And of course, I can, oops, I can extend this as I like with more and more data. OK, so that's pretty handy. Let me show you another example. This is going to be a sheaf not of vector spaces, but a sheaf of sets. So in particular, what should the associated function, restriction functions be? Not linear maps, just functions on sets. OK, 
So here, here's the idea. This is a wireless network. Each node represents a wireless node. So each vertex represents a wireless node. And each face represents a shared broadcast channel. So what, this, what you should interpret this as saying is, this is node one. It can talk to node two through a shared broadcast channel. Here's node two. If node two turns on, it can talk to node one. And it will also talk to node two, three, and four. But the interpretation here is that if node two is talking and three, say, transmitting to node three, node four cannot use that same channel. This channel is in use by node two. OK, so that's the idea. Now how do I represent, then, who's talking? Who's using the channel at every portion of this network? Well, what are the options? What are the stalks? The stalk over this vertex is what nodes this particular node can hear. Well, it can hear itself if it's, if it's transmitting. It can hear node two because it can communicate. Or, and I'm using this symbol to say the channel is idle. No one is talking. OK, now what about this channel here? What can that channel hear, the channel itself? The channel can hear just the same information. Node one can talk, node two can talk, or idle. Things get interesting when we go to the next one, because now node one can be heard at that node, two can be heard at that node, and so could three and four. And of course, the channel could still be idle. OK, so those are the various kinds of stocks that are out there. But you can even get something a little more subtle, that here on this one, what do I hear? Two, three, four, but this particular note link here cannot hear node number one or any of the other nodes. They're not connected to that, that particular link. OK, so those are the stocks. Yeah? You used the term uh, channel. Yes. So a channel, I mean, is, is a particular communication pathway that is shared between various nodes. And it may be shared between a collection of multiple nodes. Which is to say, for instance, we're in this room right now. If I'm talking, that everyone else can hear me. And if anyone else were to talk, we would all hear each other. That would be represented in this as some high dimensional simplex. Two connects to, well, that, that, OK, that's a good question. Is it three channels or is it really two in some sense? Because really what's happening here, it could talk to three nodes. But it really is only use it, utilizing two. Again, this is the top dimensional simplex thing. It's utilizing two channels. As in, be, that's right. That's right. So the other channel talks to both, two, both three and four. Yes, yes, that's right. The other channel hits up both three and four simultaneously. Yes. OK. And that actually is a great lead into what I want to say next is with the restriction maps. What do they look like? So, well, so sorry. Yeah. Why wouldn't you, you say that there's one channel and two is broadcasting to one, three, and four on that one channel? I suppose you might say that. Yeah, OK. You know, I, I look at it. That's yeah. In a wireless network, that's what I would think would be. Yeah, I, actually, I think, you're, I think that's a, a, yeah, maybe that's a better way to say that. Actually, now, now that you mention that, okay, you, you're okay with that. All right, is everyone else okay with that point? The point point being that 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 when two is broadcasting, three, four, and one also here. Although this particular link here could be utilized just by one and two alone when one is transmitting. Yes, but but when two is transmitting, it's really you, everyone here in this. In fact, everyone in this star over mm -hmm. node two is is getting affected. Yes. OK, so that restriction map, what is that, that? So I've told you what the stalks are. What's the restriction map? Well, the restriction map, what it's doing, is it's really linking up who is using the channel. So in particular, node 1, if node 1 is transmitting here, as in node 2 is listening to node 1, can node 4 or node 3 hear it? No. Can this, and, and, and that's right, and this link here will not hear, will not contain nodes 1 tracking. So node one, where does node, node one maps to idle, in fact? This is enforcing that this channel must be idle. Yeah, two, three, and four, and, and this symbol here all map directly two to two, three to three, four to four. So this builds up a structure that is a sheaf of sets. Different structure, different kind of questions that, that you can then ans answer. Global sections are now not vector spaces. What are global sections? They're assignments of channel ID or node IDs to this network saying who's transmitting in a way that prevents interference. 
This is, so uh, what a global section of this sheaf is, is a, an interference-free channel usage pattern. Now you might ask, okay, how many are these and all that sort of thing. You might think that that's actually immediately an NP-complete kind of problem. But it turns out that it's actually not in this particular instance. You can actually decompose the sections kind of nicely. Uh, that's not really the direction I want to go with this, but I just want to say that it's not a vector space. This is very much set value. These are, these are all sets that we're working with. And there's many situations where the appropriate sheaf starts out as a set. One of the things that you'll we'll see a little bit later on is that when we want to compute with sheaves, that we really need to talk about whether we need vector spaces or not. Sometimes we do, and sometimes in this situation, we would like to get some invariants out of this that are vector space like. Um, and that leads to, to a whole bunch of discussions on categorification. Okay, so, yeah. So the restriction maps sort of go up in dimension. Up in dimension, mm -hmm. that's right. Restriction maps go up in dimension. And so in particular, here I'm going from a zero dimensional to a one dimensional. There's also a restriction map that goes from this one dimensional edge to this two dimensional phase. So in some contexts, I guess, it would be like uh, going from bigger to smaller, right? It, it feels very much in this context from bigger to smaller. And that's exactly what it is. Because what, when you ask, let's look at the, the stars and the Alexandrov topology over this, what is the star over two? It is two, this edge, this edge, that face, that face. What's the star over this? It's a subset, it's a smaller thing. So we're going from this big star, which is what's really, that's where the data is, to this smaller star. So we are restricting our attention. Other questions? Okay, so let me sort of show you what some of these sections might look like. Here's a simpler link complex, the same sheaf that we had laid out. Um, but you can get, in addition to <clears throat> this structure, we can start actually enumerating all those sections. So for instance, we've got a, a section where one is transmitting. We've got one is transmitting, one is using this link, and two is hearing it. That's forcing by this particular protocol that we've built this link is idle, and this node is idle. If two is transmitting, the whole network is lit up. If three is transmitting, which I'm not showing here, what would happen? Well, I would, if three is transmitting, I would see three here, three here, three here, and then idle and idle. Of course, there's one more state that's a global section, which is everything is idle. That's another global state as well. Now, you could also, in this model, if you're not dealing with global sections, you can deal with collisions. If I have one, one, three, three, there's no way I can extend to that vertex. That's a collision. So sections that are purely local and cannot be extended to global sections are situations where I have a collision. So this allows me to represent those sort of protocols. Yes, as they do here. Okay, I mean, that's... So, yes, in, in fact, the... the, the so, so I, think about, I think about the arrow going this way as being different from the arrow going that way. Ah, uh, no. In this case, they are not. They're, they're the same they're, thing. Yes, they're the same thing. Yes. That's right. If you notice the diagram on the lower left shows mm -hmm. how the arrows... Right. Really, they're the sort of de bottom up. up. Yeah. Right. Sure. In a way, sure. you're better off thinking of them as different levels that's right. than all in a line. Right, and, and in particular, this is dimension zero simplices, this is dimension one simplices. If I had a more complicated complex, I'd have dimension two, three, four, et cetera, mm -hmm. stacked higher and higher. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe I missed it very early on in this lecture, but you, when you laid down R2 and R3 yes. on the very early simplex clusters, mm -hmm. um, that all reflects the fact that you're doing Yes. So the larger spaces to the smaller spaces. That's right. Okay. Yep. Yep. So again, the point being that if you look at the Alexandrov topology, look at the stars, mm -hmm. restriction maps go from big stars to small stars. They restrict, as the name suggests. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, if you have co-sheaf, they go the other way. They go from small to big, i.e. they're extensions. Okay, so let's come back to the notion of fusing images and other such things. Now, if I have multiple images, now, now the data sets, the topological space is not necessarily any more complicated, but the data sets represent much more rich stocks, as in there's spaces of images now. I've got a space of images sitting over one vertex. You can imagine a vertex here, an edge, and a vertex here. What's sitting over each of these are spaces of images. They're function spaces, potentially very high dimensional. But now the transformations that I've gotten are much more complicated. They are either cropping, or in this particular beautiful mosaic here, they're probably also perspective change transformations that go from one image to the next, from one camera pose to the next, that all fit together. This is, of course, a very, very old problem. Um, image registration is something that has been done for a long time. Image mosaicing has been done for a long time. Um, and many of these are pretty robust to small perspective changes. Okay, that's good. In fact, I mean, they make these nice pictures. But what if you've got really big perspective changes? What if you're really looking at things that were, where the images are really way out of whack? Can I do anything that's mosaic-like anymore? And what I, what I suppose that is the right way to think about this is that actually what you have to do at that point is you have to leave the realm of trying to form a mosaic image and instead have to go through some other discrete kind of data source. In particular, you need to go from homogeneous data fusion, which this is, to heterogeneous data fusion. So here's kind of the, here's kind of the problem statement. And this is some joint work on the Simplex project with UCLA where the idea is that my measurements that I'm taking are vertices through time. And so I take a variety of these locations. This is sort of an abstract picture. And I put connections between these vertices when I think that there's some reason to think that we're looking at more or less the same picture. Now, you can get really very different changes in pose. So in particular, these are all pictures of the same set of objects, more or less. Not exactly all the same set of objects, but we're looking at slightly different views of them. Uh, and not necessarily the same ones. There's some overlap. So in particular, there's these objects here are present over here, but these objects are not present in these images. And you can only get really the bottom corner of that guy right there. So this is really not the situation where registration algorithms are going to work well. So in fact, having written some of these algorithms, they're going to get very confused by the fact that most of what I see in this image are these textural features. Some of them are going to match up, but you're going to get a pretty high false alarm rate. It's going to be very hard to fuse that in a reasonable fashion. So really, I think the right way to go after this, and chief theory supports this, is to go very, very heavily towards the, the, the heterogeneous framework idea, saying that rather than looking for images and matching up the images directly, trying to splice this image to that one to that one, what I should be doing is looking at the level of objects and trying to match up the objects. What I will get out as global sections then are objects paired with images in a certain way. So in essence, what I've got is something like this. I have two cameras taking two images, very different poses, very different orientations, different lighting. That's fine. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to boil these down. I'm, I'm going to summarize them in some fashion. So in particular, I'm going to say in the overlap region, and there is some overlap region, or we wouldn't be talking about this, where there's some objects that are similar. There they are. There are some objects that are similar, but probably can't actually line them up perfectly. But what I probably can do is I probably can identify that these are probably similar objects. And if there's similar, enough similar objects in the overlap, then I can probably say that I probably will stick this object to that one in some abstract way, that object into that object in some abstract way. And what I will get is I will get, again, a sheaf over Simplicial complex that's got simplex, simplex, edge. So vertex, vertex, edge. And the data over this vertex is all the data out of that camera. The data out of that one is all the data out of that camera. But now the data over the edge is not a space of images. It's a space of detections, more semantic data. When those two sets of detections, that from this image and that from this image, match up, then I say that we've got some images that are, that are looking at the same pose. That will give me an idea when I try to fuse them, when I globalize, that what I'll end up with is I'll end up with something that looks like lists of detections that are not necessarily common, but seeing 
when I saw these various detections, they're nearby one another. That says that I can kind of extrapolate that these other detections are also nearby these other ones. So it gives you sort of a, a, an overall more abstract way to put together these pictures. And in some sense, this is, this is kind of the way that, that people navigate, is that I don't necessarily have a perfect picture of a 3D understanding of where everything is. I have a pretty good idea of where things are and where they are in relation to one another. But I don't necessarily know exactly how to transform the view of this particular object into the view of all of these other objects. I just know where roughly the objects are. This gives me a way to assemble that in some reasonable fashion. So that's kind of neat, kind of useful. Um, and this is more or less very, very preliminary work that this can be done. Uh, so I think now is a good time to, to talk about what's coming up next. Now that we know what a sheath is, I'm going to start building some of them in software. And we'll talk then about some more very detailed examples of sheaths addressing specific data structures that people like to use, like basenets and so on. So thank you.